Hello and thank you for tuning in. The work I'm presenting here is dealing with minor extractable value and this work is a continuation of the Wendy protocol we presented a couple of months ago at the AFT conference. Now, minor extractable value doesn't need a lot of introduction anymore. It's become a bit of a hot topic. So the main issue is that if you talk about exchanges, both centralized and decentralized, transaction order translates into money. There's a very nice book, Flash Boys, which uh, describes stories of flash traders spending hundreds of millions to shave off microseconds of transaction time and then turn this again into hundreds of millions of profit. Now, in the decentralized world, timing attacks can actually be much easier as now it's sufficient to run a few validators um, to get access to the consensus layer internals and then rather than needing very fast connections you need to understand the consensus protocol and act on seeing messages early now by now we also have numbers on what the damage is um, these are numbers from the mev dash, uh, dashboard that shows that we average now over 1 million uh, mev damage on ethereum alone and that has two problems so for one it's a tax on normal users the value they extract from other transaction. It's not creating value, it's extracting value that is then missing somewhere else. And depending on what blockchain you use, it can screw up the validator economy. In an ideal world, a validator gets paid for validating. Um, if we have too much MEV, then validators get paid for fencing off priority access. And the result is a little bit similar to if the main business model of the police would be bribery. Uh, that leads to a lot of effects that then lead to a country we probably don't want to live in. Now, the state of defense, um, there's a couple of approaches. One is to make it harder to um, influence transactions by distributing the influence over many validators. And the two main approaches here is leaderless protocols, um, our own from 2001 and now the more modern Honey Badger. Um, these protocols don't have one validator that leads a pack, so it's harder to be the validator that determines the order. Or in the BFT style world, fast leader switching that every block is generated by a new leader. And thus it's again harder for an individual validator to uh, control the order of a lot of events. There's some work that is pretty new to control the financial damage um, through MEV by spreading the proceeds and um, democratizing the process. A pretty old approach is causal, uh, causal order, which is now called commit and reveal. Um, that exists since Reiter and Biermann in 95. And the idea there is essentially that I encrypt the transaction before I put it in a block and I decrypt it only after the order has been committed to. And the recent work um, on block order fairness, there were the two papers uh, last year, the Alequitas protocol from Cornell University and our own Wendy, which um, set an order policy for transactions and then makes sure that this order is actually um, respected by the blockchain protocol. Now, our goal is to extend this approach to a framework approach. The original order protocols had one policy that they could enforce. We want a variety of fairness and MEV policies that can suit various use cases. And we want to combine order fairness with the causal order. Fair, uh, causal order. And additionally, the goal is that this framework makes it easier to design and evaluate new policies. So why do we want to combine commit and reveal with order fairness? Um, it's actually a very nice combination. So in commit and reveal, I control the information flow. It use, it's used for individual transactions. It does only prevent front running attacks that require to know the content of a transaction. And the big issue there is uh, I can only reveal the message once the transaction is final, which for some blockchains, like the non-finalizing ones, can be a very long time in which we have a little bit of a messy situation. And order fairness is in a way uh, orthogonal to this. We control transaction order, not information flow. We work on a set of related transactions. Um, 
but we are open to attacks similar to what the original Flash Boys do, uh, did if they have then very, very fast lines to our validators. Now, if you combine those, um, we take away those attacks, but especially do we make the commit and reveal scheme much stronger because now it can reveal once a transaction is not front-runnable uh, front anymore, which is done by the um, order fairness protocol, so we can reveal much earlier than we could otherwise. Now, the setup and model. Uh, we require a known set of validators, so I wouldn't call this a permission network, but um, we are not registrationless. We need to know who the validators are and they need to authenticate each other. If we have a registrationless protocol like Ethereum, like Bitcoin, then we can use a separate set or a subset of validators, just as um, is done in the case of Casper for finality on Ethereum. Uh, we assume we have n validators, some fraction t of which um, are corrupt. We are still thinking about a more advanced model that also takes into account non-attackers uh, that don't collaborate with each other, but that's pretty hard work and um, we're still on that. Uh, we assume fully asynchronous uh, communication, um, although individual policies may require additional assumptions like a synchrony or a halfway synchronized um, clocks. Uh, the protocol, like the original Wendy, is an add-on for an existing consensus layer. Um, we don't have any hard requirements on the consensus layer, but it would help if it's halfway collaborative and um, doesn't try to reorder the messages that we give to it. And we assume a multi-use chain, so we want several instances. Uh, we want to have different fairness policies in parallel, working on different kinds of transactions. So transactions that are unrelated to each other don't need to be fair with respect to each other. So we have groups of transactions that are fair with respect to each other, and some transactions don't need any fairness at all, so they can bypass this fairness protocol altogether. Now, the framework protocol has uh, three basic parts. One is dissemination. Um, and in dissemination, essentially, every validator collects all the information they have about a transaction and sends it to all the other validators. Uh, the one important thing there is the transactions get sequence numbers. So once I see a transaction, I know all the transactions that that validator has seen until then with all the data. Um, but otherwise, it can be a simple multicast, and we just throw in all the information uh, on these transactions we have. Then with this data, um, there's uh, two parts for order fairness and for um, causality. Uh, we compute blocking sets, and a blocking set means which transaction needs to be delayed to wait for another one by the order rules. And the other part is the reveal. We compute from the data when can we um, reveal a transaction and multicast the decryption shares. And the last thing is interaction with the blockchain. Um, if the blockchain delivers a block, we know those transactions are now handled with and they can be deleted from uh, the other stages. And then we prepare a new block from uh, the transactions that are not blocked and uh, that we can send on. Uh, finally, there's post-processing. Since we now talk about uh, putting transactions into blocks, the post-processing can then uh, apply an order policy on the transactions that were inside one block. Now, the policy is only implemented in computing the blocking sets and in the revealing. So this is actually then the core of the protocol and where your own policy can come in. And there's essentially now four uh, different um, functions we have. So a function is blocked if given all the knowledge we have about it at that time, it's possible that a currently unknown transaction needs to get precedence over it. And that essentially means we cannot possibly put this uh, transaction into the next block because there may be a new transaction that we have never heard about that needs to be scheduled before um, our transaction. A uh, transaction depends on another transaction. If by all we know, 
a known and yet not delivered transaction might be preferred over it. Um, that doesn't block the transaction per se, but it means that uh, if I put my transaction in the next block, then the one it depends on needs to be in the next block too. And if the one it depends on is blocked, then my transaction is blocked too. This is the two um, properties we need for order. Then revealable is if uh, given the current knowledge, this transaction will get precedence over all newly generated transactions. So if somebody finds out what my transaction is now, the commit and reveal decrypts, then they have no way given the ordering policy to um, get their uh, message before. And what we're still working on to speed things up is the concept of weakly revealable uh, transactions. And that means essentially this transaction is not blocked, will very soon be scheduled. It's not possible for a new transaction to get precedence over it. So with very high probability, this uh, no new transaction can ov uh, overtake it. This is not true in a fully asynchronous system, but in most realistic systems, we should be reasonably good with that. But this is work in progress, so exact definitions may still vary at some point. So to add some meat to the bones, let's see how that works for fair block order, which is the policy we implemented in the original Wendy protocol. So the policy is if all honest parties see T1 before T2, then T1 must be in the same and earlier block than T2. And where possible, T1 actually should be scheduled before T2, but this can sometimes be undecidable. The blocking function is pretty simple. Uh, transaction T is blocked if less than T plus one valid votes are received. T plus one is the threshold where we know one, honest, uh, one of the votes was from an honest party. So if I'm not sure that I got a single vote from an honest party, then it may be that there are transactions still out there that have to overtake T. Um, the dependency we define the other way around. A transaction T1 does not depend on T2. If T plus one and thus at least one honest vote has reported T1 before T2, that means that it's not possible that all honest party report T2 before T1. So T2 does not need to come before T1. Um, about revealing, if I have n valid votes, then all honest parties have seen T. So any transactions that is created after n valid votes have been cast, it's not possible um, that this transaction, um, that, that I create a new transaction that does not depend on T. And for weak reve uh, revealing, if I have n minus T valid votes before T, then T is not blocked. And um, it's not possible that anyone can get precedence before T. So T will be scheduled soon and any newly created transaction will, if I have some synchrony assumptions, very likely be um, scheduled after T. Um, now there's some requirements for having a good policy. So the first and most important one, we want the policy to only build on measurable properties. So if I say, for example, I want a um, policy, if A was sent before B, then it needs to be scheduled first, then I would need a trusted timer on all the clients that tells me when a transaction was sent. Um, also in the chosen model I am, for example, asynchronous Byzantine, I may not always have all the information available. So in an asynchronous system, I need to always work with a subset of um, all the information I have. Um, so I also need to make sure I see in, in the chosen model I have, I see all the information I need to determine whether a transaction is, for example, blocked or not. We want to ideally be loop free. Um, so we don't want a situation where A needs to be scheduled before B, B before C and C before A. Uh, we want uh, to efficiently terminate. That's actually the, one of the most important ones. So there's a lot of definition behind the word fast, but for us it just means every transaction is within a reasonably time frame also put into a block. Um, there's a couple of problems with this. Um, so if you go, for example, by gas prices, if A offers more gas than B, we don't know who comes up with what um, gas prices later. So this is not a possible policy because we could never schedule anything. 
but there's also other policies where we cannot assure um, to ever terminate. And the last thing is uh, monotony. Uh, once you're unblocked, you stay unblocked. Um, if we don't have this, then there's some possibility that a validator can cheat by having a transaction that would be uh, blocked again by a new transaction that comes in and they can just pretend they never saw this until their transaction is safe. Also, um, if you're not monotonous, then we can't help much uh, with uh, commit and reveal because um, we can't reveal once a transaction is unblocked since it may become blocked again. So now after giving um, these requirements, I have to immediately wa uh, walk back on them. Even the policy we just had, fair block order, doesn't actually satisfy all the requirements. Um, it's not loop free and it's not terminating. Um, we can have a loop that has been shown in um, the original paper and we can have a loop of arbitrary size, which means we cannot guarantee that we ever terminate. Now, that means we need ways um, to work around uh, not met requirements. Um, measurability, well, the easiest way is to um, adapt the system requirements, add synchrony, add clocks, um, whatever we need. If that fails, we have the same mechanism that we um, use in um, efficient termination. Uh, if we detect that we have a problem, we are not terminating, we can't measure all the things we do due to some Byzantine misbehavior, for example. We can temporarily switch to weaker policy to re resolve the deadlock and then switch back. And that's one of the beauties of um, our protocol. We can switch policies on the fly, we can switch back and we can essentially always choose the policy that uh, serves us best at, this, uh, at the moment. Uh, loop free was also a problem we had in the original paper. There the, this is actually why we had block order fairness and not order fairness. If you have a loop, you put all the transactions of the loop in the same block and let the application uh, figure out what to do with this. And for monotony, we just need to accept the limits um, that there is a way of cheating and that it doesn't work very well with commit and reveal and uh, move on from there. Um, now the next policy example, um, timed fairness. I'm not going into the details here, but that's a clock-based policy that is very nice as in that it meets all the requirements. So we have efficient termination at all times. So this is a very nice backup policy if the other ones um, don't work. Um, and the last one I want to show uh, is a capitalistic policy with social security. So this is very similar to Ethereum, but we add um, a function that if a transaction waits long enough, it gets scheduled anyhow. And here we essentially encode our fee system and the longer you wait, the higher your virtual fee is. And as this is not monotonous, as mentioned above, um, the revealability isn't really supported by this policy. Now, we also did some performance measurements and um, integration sorts. So the protocol runs in parallel to the blockchain, so it doesn't add latency to the blockchain. Um, it does uh, cause a little bit more network traffic and computation time that we haven't fully measured yet. The other thing that happens is that transactions are sometimes delayed to later blocks. And the dominant factor there is that usually a transaction is blocked until T plus one votes comes in. And if this transaction is blocked at the time that um, the blockchain creates a new block, then that transaction can't go into the block and needs to wait for the blockchain to be ready and prepare the next block. And thus the uh, ratio of transactions that are actually delayed this way is pretty much exactly the ratio of message delivery time to block processing time. Um, all the others are comparatively small effects compared to this. Now for implementation, um, there's a couple of things on the interfacing um, that need to be taken care of, but none of them is actually really hard. Uh, the only hard question here is that fees can be an issue on Ethereum, for example, if I have a high priority message that doesn't pay its own uh, gas, then what are the lower priority messages going to do to 
um, still get scheduled. And with this, I'm at the end. So um, thank you for listening and um, goodbye.